in fish that come from polluted environments. And certainly Dr. Blodgett has given you a, a very comprehensive overview of that subject with his discussion of environmental toxicosis. I think all of us are concerned about the potential for pollution causing disease in the biota, in animals and in man, primarily because of the uh, exposure that we may have from concurrent substances in the environment, and also because we're consumers or terminal predators of animals in the environment. We talk a lot about mink eating fish, birds eating fish. Well, people eat a lot of fish too. And I think that that has raised our level of concern about what is in our food stuff, what's in our water, and how does it affect us. Now specifically, we understand that there are certain factors that are associated with the development of neoplasia. And certainly this is no more than a review for all of you since I'm sure you're familiar with these factors. For example, we know that exposure to agents which damage DNA or gene structure and cause mutation are provocateurs of the development of neoplasia by the transformation of stem cells which are susceptible. Radiation, viruses, and chemicals have all been associated with the development of neoplasms in animals and in man. We know that one factor that's important in the development of a neoplasm is the stability or the inherent stability and structure of the DNA in the gene and the efficiency or efficacy of repair mechanisms which can take damaged DNA, excise it, and repair it. And there's a great deal of difference between animals, tissues in animals, individual cells, and the ability to repair damaged gene. We know that there are genetic predispositions which are related to gene structure and to DNA structure and composition. And genetic predispositions will lead other animals or some animals to be more susceptible to the effects of some of these oncogenic agents and develop neoplasms. We know, for example, that squamous cell carcinoma is much more prevalent in animals that have dilute coat color, white-faced herefords and white cats, where exposure to ultraviolet radiation plus an inherent inability to repair gene damage is going to lead to the development of squamous cell carcinoma. <coughs> There's other factors that we're familiar with. For example, the cooperative effects of oncogenes and anti-oncogenes. I used to analogize this to the sort of thing in a car about having the engine and the brakes, with the oncogenes being the engine that drives the cell toward growth and division, and the anti-oncogene being the brakes. I think I now understand it that these oncogenes are all of the components of the engine, and that the anti-oncogenes are the brakes, and all the components of the hydraulic system, the fluid, the pads, and so forth. It's a very, very confusing set of circumstances. level. Dr. Court is going to insist that I wear this. Just a moment. The age of an animal is very, very important to determine whether, in fact, a neoplasm will develop. There are a variety of nonspecific factors which function for the promotion of cell growth and cell turnover and therefore the expression of non-lethal genetic damage and the expression of a neoplasm. Clearly there is an effect of diet and metabolism. There are species, feral species, domesticated species, rodents, rats, strains of mice that differ markedly in their ability to metabolize a compound and therefore express an oncogenic or neoplastic effect. One factor in the development of neoplasia is the magnitude and duration of exposure. And in the case of feral fish, which I'm going to talk about today, the complexity of the exposure. That is, whether there are multiple and additive effects of various chemicals in the environment 
coupled with susceptible species living in a certain environment that have certain metabolic capabilities for the development of neoplasia and others, obviously many, many factors which we do not yet understand that influence the development of neoplasms. Now the relationship between some injurious agents, radiation, chemicals, and viruses, and neoplasms has been fairly well established through epidemiologic studies, field studies, and or laboratory studies. We know, for example, that in man, there is a very high risk of the development of lung cancer with exposure to cigarette smoke. Likewise, there's little question in anyone's mind that exposure to asbestos is going to lead to the development of mesothelioma. I've already alluded to the fact that ultraviolet radiation in dilute coat color animals can lead to the development of squamous cell carcinoma, cattle, cats, and otherwise. In 1966, we learned that fish were particularly susceptible, rainbow trout in a hatchery situation, exposed to aflatoxin B1 in their feed, developed hepatic neoplasms, and I'll show you a few of them in a moment. Hepatitis B virus in man, leading to hepatocellular carcinoma. The exposure to feline leukemia virus and the subsequent development of lymphosarcoma in cats, all well known, well established, exposure to an injurious agent and then subsequent development of neoplasm. This is the sort of classic thing listed from whale study in 1966, where trout fed contaminated feed in a hatchery situation developed pedicellular carcinomas and hepatomas. There's no surprises for people that have been in an industrial setting for a long period of time where we study the progression of pharmaceutical lesions to hepatocellular carcinoma. But here again you can see the presence of a large nodular lesion. And when you look at that, a fairly typical structure for hepatocellular carcinoma in the liver of a fish, and I'll show you several. Uh, here we have cords of somewhat pleomorphic cells partially encapsulated by proliferation of connective tissue, surrounding vessels, perhaps with some ground substance increased. Once again, these isolated cords of hepatocytes showing some retention of hepatocellular structure, not a great degree of mitosis that we would see here or associate with it. I would classify this as a moderately well differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma. fairly typical for some of the lesions that we're going to see today is this abrupt zone of transition between the normal liver on the upper part of the screen and the transformed portion of the liver on the lower part of the screen here. Unlike the nodules that we see in some rodent livers, we're not seeing a compressive effect of the proliferation of connective tissue or the death or atrophy of hepatocytes at the edges of some of these nodules, although that may not be the rule. One has to look at it for each of the specific cases. But again, normal hepatocytic structure, rainbow trout, hepatocellular carcinoma caused by exposure to aflatoxin. We know in trout that there's several things that will influence the development of this particular neoplasm. We know, for example, that co-exposure to other compounds like PCBs can in some cases reduce the incidence of neoplasia by altering the metabolic profile away from potent carcinogens like aflatoxicol and toward aflatoxin M1. So these metabolites can change. At other times when PCBs and other inducers are given, they may actually increase the development of hepatocellular neoplasia in trout. So this has been a good modeling system that we've used. Now one of the things that's very vexing to all of us, and I think a potential concern to us and a social issue, is the fact that this relationship between the injurious agents and neoplasms is less well established or the comparative aspects are questionable. I think it's quite easy to say from experimental studies that exposure to large doses of cyclamates and saccharins and sprayed dolly rats will lead to the development of bladder cancer in those rats but people have repeatedly questioned whether in fact it has relevance to the exposure levels in man. And quite honestly, we don't know. This is perhaps the single reason that I left the pharmaceutical industry. Various pharmaceuticals can produce neoplasms in rats and mice, but do not do so in other species. And we constantly question whether there is any sort of comparative effect where we can say that a rat is like a mouse is like a man. 
And I always felt quite uncomfortable with the fact that we would see something that was a potent carcinogen in one of these species that we knew that could metabolize it and produce many metabolic intermediates and study the enzyme histochemistry, but we're left with big questions as to whether it was going to cause the same problem in human beings. And that is the same sort of issue that we're going to deal with when looking at feral fish as monitors for human exposure and animal exposure. We know that environmental exposure to PCBs and polyaromatic or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons may cause neoplasms in some species but not in all species. We know that in the laboratory, rats and mice are exquisitely sensitive to PCBs, both as a toxicant and as a carcinogen. But we're left with the big question again about whether the low level exposure in the environment is responsible for some of the neoplasms that we're going to see. I feel that in all of the work that we do when we're looking at feral fish and wild species, that the central issue is whether the comparative pathology is that if the occurrence of neoplasms in the sensitive species is relevant to the development of lesions in other animals or in man. And if it is relevant, that usually leads to some type of regulatory action. But it's very, very hard for us as a society to adopt that philosophy that this exposure in fish is something that we should do, do something about because of the potential for exposure in other animals or in man. There have been a number of very, very well documented field studies and I will just deal with field studies today, not experimental exposure other than the rainbow trout, in which the documented increase in the presence of neoplasms can be traced to some type of a polluted environment. In the mid-1970s and 80s, there was increased attention paid to the incidence of neoplasms in the liver of some species of sole in Puget Sound. Now Puget Sound is a marine estuarine environment on which the cities of Olympia, Tacoma, Seattle, Bremerton, and Port Madison are located as well as other places on the Pacific Northwest Coast. This is not a pristine environment. Those of you that have been to Seattle and the surrounding area will know. It is a hev heavily, heavily industrialized and contaminated area. Principal industrial activities in the area include shipping and the discharge of petrochemicals associated with shipping as waste products, bilge pump, and so forth. Lumbering enter uh, enterprises, light and heavy manufacturing, and up till recent days, the chemical production, in particular that of creosote, which is a distillate product, as a component of lumbering. The bottom sediments that are present in Puget Sound have been studied extensively by Mallins and his co-workers in the mid-1980s. One of the things that they found was that these bottom sediments contain hundreds of organic and inorganic chemicals. You can see a list here on this portion of the screen, not particularly relevant that you know each one, but bottom sediments that were known in the 1980s, and this list has increased some five-fold in the last 10 to 14 years. Halogenated insecticides, herbicides, organophosphates, inorganic chlorines, carbamates, petroleum derivatives, herbicides, metal and nitrogenous compounds, various chemotherapeutic agents, some of them used in fish, some of them not used in fish, and a whole variety of other things contaminate bottom sediment. As Dr. Blodgett is concerned about the effects of estrogenic effects, immunosuppressive effects, one of my principal concerns is what happens when bacterial organisms interact with some of the organic compounds in sediment. They're literally making hundreds and thousands of new compounds through metabolism, and we have no idea what these are or how to study them. So between 1975 and 1985, there was increased attention to neoplasms, particularly in English sole, by Mallins, Myers, and Rhodes. For a number of years prior to a comprehensive and systematic study of this estuarine environment, lay people had noted that there were neoplasms or lumps or tumors or growths in the livers and on the external surfaces of some species of fish. These authors decided to do a controlled study, and in their field study, they studied eight to 12 study sites, some of them from heavily polluted environments where they measured the bottom sediments, and other, other places on the Puget Sound environment that were lightly polluted or not polluted at all, particularly around Port Madison. And the way they conducted their study was by trawling 
at a depth of 10 to 100 meters. And so primarily by trawling, they were picking a bottom dwelling fish, which they had reason to believe would be increased contact with a contaminated environment and perhaps would express a neoplastic effect. In their particular study, they collected 1,083 English sole and determined their age by the measurement of otoliths. They found the following things. First, hepatic neoplasms were present in three to five percent of all of the English sole that they studied and there was some degree of variation by year. In some years, the percentage would be much higher, up around 5%, sometimes would decrease to 3%, but it was fairly consistent. They found foci of cellular alteration, clear cell, eosinophilic, and basophilic foci in between 5 and 11% of the fish. There were other indications of liver toxicity, including hepatocellular degeneration and necrosis in 10 to 35% of the fish. I find that quite remarkable. They also found deposited pigments, vacuoles, and fatty change in 10 to 20% of the fish. Now it should be quite obvious to you that some of these fish had multiple lesions. In hepatic inflammatory lesions in 10 to 30% of the fish, again, some degree of variation by year. It's just quite remarkable that in a random sample, a third of the population of fish are affected by some type of toxicity, and some 5% of the fish have neoplasia. The English sole have a hepatopancreas. Here you can see an islet of pancreatic tissue, a duct, and once again, normal liver here with some sinusoids and an abrupt zone of transition again between the normal liver at the bottom of the screen and the transformed neoplastic hepatocellular carcinoma on the upper portion of the screen. Once again, some degree of cell pleomorphism, a loss of cord-like architecture, compression of sinusoids, difficult to see in here rough retention of the chaining or cords, not a high degree of mitosis. In this particular case, very little connective tissue or compression at the edge of the lesion. And I think you can appreciate the fact that most of these cells that are present in the neoplasm look more or less similar. Single nucleolus, round nucleus, little degree of basophilic cytoplasm, a sort of pale lesion. In some places in this hepatocellular carcinoma, clearly cord-like architecture that can be detected. Again, moderately to well-differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma in the livers of English soul feeding on the bottom in Puget Sound. There were lesions in other tissues. Proliferative lesions were seen in the kidney of 10 to 30 percent of the fish proliferative lesions being judged as proliferations of individual or clusters of cells within tubules, clusters of interstitial cells, necrotic areas within tubules and perhaps tubular regeneration. Areas of tubular degeneration and necrosis were seen in 15 to 20 percent of the fish that were studied. In addition, there were pigment deposits, vacuoles and fatty change in renal epithelium in 2 to 15 percent of fish studied, again, English sole, and the variation year by year. Nephritis, inflammatory lesions seen in 1 to 3 percent of the fish. These were carefully conducted in controlled field studies. They were remarkable in that regard. These were not fishermen going out and putting their line in the water. These were people going repetitively to the same site year after year after year, trawling with the same methods, going for the same period of time, and doing systematic investigation. There was consistency of the team that did the investigation. The same individuals examined the slides year after year, and so there was diagnostic continuity. They found the hepatic neoplasms were most common in older fish, and that the incidence increased with age mean age 5.6 years. It struck me that these fish were more successful in staying in the environment or perhaps people were not going out and catching them or sampling them because they knew that this was a polluted environment. Now I have not been to the Seattle area but I would be reluctant to eat fish that come out of Puget Sound knowing this. 
Somebody from Seattle here, are they? He's probably laughing because he knows I've probably eaten them anyway. One of the things that I discussed earlier was factors that are associated with the increased incidence of neoplasms, age being one of those factors. Obviously, we believe that there has been more exposure, more chances of metabolism, more chances for mutagenesis and transformation of cells, and subsequently the development of neoplasms. Neoplasms were seen in fish that were as young as one year, one year, and were seen in fish that were eight years and older, but the mean age was 5.6 years. The incidence of altered cell foci also increased with age. There's been a considerable amount of debate over the years on whether these foci of cell alteration are in fact preneoplastic lesions. They have altered enzyme activity, storage of iron, ability to synthesize glucose and perform other metabolic activities. We know that the younger incidence here probably suggests that these, at least in these fish, may be precursor lesions because as there's an increase in altered cell foci, so in later years we see an increase in the number of hepatocellular carcinomas. Renal lesions were seen in slightly younger fish, the proliferative lesion mean age being 4.4 years. Again, the authors that have categorized this lesion have not spoken to the fact that this is a neoplastic lesion, only suggesting it's proliferative, perhaps under control hyperplasia of the tubular epithelium, but nonetheless something to think about. This age-associated increase or incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma has been noted by others looking at different species in different environments, in the Rhine River, in the Elbe River, in an English sole in the Commencement Bay. So we know that looking at different species of fish in different environments exposed to different pollutants, that this effect seems to hold true. With increased age and exposure to certain types of pollutants, which I've detailed for you here, there tends to be an increased incidence of neoplasia in some species of fish. Now you'll probably note today during the talk that I don't discuss all different species of fish. And in fact, in the Puget Sound environment, there have been repeated attempts made to look at different species of fish. It is the English sole in that particular environment, a particular type of bottom feeding fish that has the highest incidence and been most well studied. So this suggests very strongly that not all fish are susceptible to these effects. Perhaps they lack vital metabolic enzymes for conversion of putative carcinogens and environmental contaminants into carcinogens in their environment, into ultimate carcinogens. So we have to think about that. One of the things that's impressed me is the fact that there's 40,000 species of fish. Now, Dennis Blodgett talked for a minute ago about the difference between rats and mice. Well, in fact, the rat is not a large mouse. It's markedly different. And it's naive for us to think that of the 40,000 or so species of fish, that they're all going to respond in a like manner. They are probably as diverse as different types of animals, fish, amphibians, reptiles, and so forth something that we have to think about when looking at the comparative aspects of neoplasia. Let's turn to another species of fish, another lesion that's been associated with exposure to some type of pollutant. Fingerling coho salmon were exposed in the 1970s in the Mackenzie River in Oregon to chlorinated and dechlorinated water from a paper pulping mill. One of the things that happens with the polluted environment is that man in his infinite wisdom has tried to detoxify and then release material into the environment. I think perhaps for a long period of time the way to get rid of waste, industrial waste and otherwise was to flush them down the toilet, put them down the drain and put them out to dilute them in a large body of water, a river, a lake, the ocean and so forth. Then there was increased attention made to treatment and one of the ways to treat these of course was to halogenate these. It does not take much of an extrapolation to know that halogenating some of these organic molecules is going to render them more reactive and electrophilic and much more likely to form DNA adducts in liver and elsewhere, therefore becoming more carcinogenic. In this particular case, coho salmon exposed to chlorinated, dechlorinated water in a hatchery situation developed neuroblastomas. The incidence of this was not high. There was but a single episode of it before the sort of exposure to this type of water was changed, but we found that in skeletal muscle near the dorsal fin, neuroblastomas developed which had a peculiar trabecular pattern with fibrillar material and cavities that were lined with ependema-like cells. And they had metastases in the vasculature. This is just such an animal. 
all right, just in front of the dorsal fin. You can appreciate the fact that uh, <clears throat> one would notice this quite readily. And when we looked at this, there was a mixture of fibromatous proliferating cells and neuroblastoma penetrating down from the spine into the tissue underneath it. So once again, a second episode of neoplasia induced by pollution in the environment, a single point source, an epizootic, if you will, leading to this development. Once there was recognition that these halogenated organic carb uh, molecules were polluting the water, they were not seen. Similar lesions were not seen in hatchery raised Chinook salmon, a species difference amongst salmon. Halogenated organics, pesticides, and elevated water temperature also occurred at the same time because the effluent or discharge from the pulping plant was heated and there was some question as to whether that was associated with an increased incidence of neoplasms in this specific type of fish. When we're doing field and environmental studies, this is one of the most vexing issues. This is the multiple additive effect issue. What is the thing that is the carcinogen? What is causing the effect? Because there are so many things that can be contributory and many times people will throw up their hands saying, we just can't study this, we don't know, there's too many things happening. One of the dodges used for many, many years about asbestos and cigarette exposure in man. This epizootic was limited to one hatch in the season in 1976 and 77 and is not seen again after an alteration in management practices at this particular hatchery. Again, the recognition that using this chlorinated, dechlorinated water of elevated temperature may be leading to the development of neuroblastoma in these coho salmon. Up to this point, we've addressed neoplasms that are likely to be the result of exposure to multiple chemicals. And in particular, a lot of studies have been done in the Puget Sound area looking at creosote, benzpyrene, dimethylbenzanthracine, some of the other polycyclics that are combustion products and contaminants of creosote production. In Torch Lake in Michigan, there was an epizootic of neoplasia in fish that was studied extensively by Black and co-workers and written up in JNCI in 1982. Torch Lake is an area that is served by uh, drainage from uh, a mining area, and Torch Lake itself is heavily contaminated with copper mining wastes, and also municipal waste and chlorinated organics and inorganics, such as chromium, lead, and zinc. Torch Lake itself is inhabited by over 20 species of fish, with a predominance of walleye, saugers, and northern pike as the dominant species. Some of them high-end predators, some not. This is quite remarkable. Liver neoplasms were found in Torch Lake in 100% of 20 saugers that were studied by gill netting. And again, this was a sampling that was done over a period of time. Perhaps 20 doesn't seem like a high number, but when you consider that every single one of the fish caught had some type of neoplasm, I think that bodes poorly for the environment and raises your level of concern. These were classified as hepatocellular carcinomas. The mean age of the fish that were caught, these saugers, was estimated at 11 years. Liver neoplasms were also found in wall-eyed pike. Ossifying dermal fibromas with extensive fibrous inflammatory reaction were noted. Beside these neoplasms, poorly differentiated visceral neoplasms were seen in the mesentery and in the spleen, classified as myxoma and lymphangiosarcomas. In this particular study in Torch Lake, there were multiple chemicals that were felt to have an effect. The role of copper and other known carcinogenic metals such as selenium and arsenic in the mine waste could not be resolved by that level of study and in fact has gone unanswered to this day. Another geographical area. Hepatomas have been known in the Atlantic tomcod in the Hudson River. Those of you that know your geography know that Schenectady and Utica, New York drain into the Hudson River and that they were a site of production of PCBs by the General Electric Corporation from about 1940 until the mid-1980s. PCBs using, being used, of course, as an insulating material, liquid insulating material, and transformers. 
Hudson River was heavily contaminated with PCBs for manufacturing operations where the predominant corporate philosophy, and I'm not getting on my soapbox, was one of dilution into the river. In this particular study by Smith et al, reported in 1978, 25% of 264 livers examined randomly from fish, tomcod, had hepatomas or hepatocellular carcinomas. We can appreciate the fact that, this, that the Hudson River is an estuarine environment discharging at the mouth of New York City and going out into the, into the Atlantic Ocean and uh, Long Island Sound. So there is a significant problem or there was with the discharge of this. Additive to that effect is the fact that PCBs are environmentally quite stable and persist in the biota for a long period of time. Lesions seen in the Tom Cod consisted of macro and micro nodules of proliferating hepatocytes, which were poorly differentiated, enlarged, and which displayed a high degree of nuclear pleomorphism in the development of cystic spaces. A slide from Dr. Harshberger, once again, normal Tom Cod liver on this end, hepatocellular carcinoma here. And I think you can appreciate that unlike the last two slides I've shown you, there is some degree of pleomorphism, increased nuclear size here, and cell differentiation. Some of them stain quite heavily, others not stain quite so heavily. A loss of cord-like architecture. Again, showing a degree of nuclear and cytoplasmic pleomorphism. and the development of large cystic spaces, some of them filled with blood and plasma, and the formation of vacuoles throughout. We believe that probably these lesions in the liver are due to the solubilization and the retention of PCBs, PCBs being a chemical family with many, many hundreds of types of compounds depending on the type, the type of chlorine solution present on the molecule. Some of them are more chemically active than others. Unfortunately, they tend to accumulate in the fat, and they tend to accumulate in species that have a high fat content, and in other species that eat animals with a high fat content. There have been numerous studies around the world that have also looked at the incidence of neoplasms in polluted environments. Studies done in Sweden in Gullmar Fjord by Falkmer and co-workers in the mid-70s established very conclusively that Atlantic hagfish, a very primitive type of fish, could be affected by the development of neoplasms primarily in the liver. Studying animals that were captured in Gullmar Fjord in Sweden, where there was a heavy discharge of both PCB and municipal waste, untreated sewage municipal waste, these investigators found hepatomas, hamartomas, and hyperplastic nodules in between 0.6 and 5.9% of some 25,000 hagfish that they studied over a period of time. Neoplastic proliferations were also seen in pancreatic islet cells, that is hepatopancreas, of these present in about one-tenth to one-half percent of all of the islets studied. The primary pollutants that were identified in Gulmar Fjord included polychlorinated biphenyls, chlorinated pesticides such as DDT, and there was a good correlation in some cases between the PCB content and exposure to aflatoxin, but it was not absolute. There were some places in which there was a very high level of exposure, local contamination with PCBs, and very few neoplasms found. And again, this confounds our ability to interpret these wildlife studies of feral fish because we do not see the direct dose relationship or magnitude of response or duration or complexity that we would like to see in a well-controlled laboratory study. As I said, the liver tumors were hepatocellular carcinomas, mixed carcinomas, and cholangiocarcinomas. Adenomas and hyperplastic nodules were also found. I've noted here a relatively poor correlation between the occurrence of neoplasm and the presence of PCBs in DDT. And there are a variety of ways that you can explain this. One is, of course, that there can be a predominance of a toxic over a neoplastic effect. That is, that the cells are damaged beyond their ability to proliferate and repair with high levels of exposure. But once again, at least these authors made the, made the effort and took the opportunity to study these neoplasms 
and try and correlate them with some of the pollutants which they believe were present in the environment. Unfortunately, we're still left with a big question mark here. Most of the tumors were seen in larger fish, suggesting those with older age. The incidence decreased when a sewage treatment plant was installed at the municipality, primarily discharging raw sewage into Gulmar Fjord. This is an example of a very typical cholangiocarcinoma that's seen in the liver of an Atlantic hagfish from Gulmar Fjord, Sweden. You can appreciate here the formation of the cholangioles or duct-like structures against normal liver here a somewhat increase in the amount of fat evacuation present in that liver. You can appreciate the fact that this spread throughout and was seen in the periphery near other areas of the gut. Okay. So it was an invasive lesion, but a reasonably and moderately well differentiated or sorry, cholangiocarcinoma. Good cell structure, good duct formation, not a high degree of cell pleomorphism. John Harshberger and his co-authors studied neoplasms in brown bullheads taken from the Black River in Ohio, an inland waterway, once again a heavily contaminated waterway, one of many that can be studied. The Black River in Ohio is contaminated with industrial wastes definition of the amount of waste material and analysis of the sediment showed that there were 26, 26 different types of polyaromatic or polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons, including benzapyrene and dimethyl benzanthracene. 30% of the brown bullheads, again a bottom feeding type of fish, were found to have epidermal, hepatocellular, and cholangiocellular carcinomas. The skin lesion seen resembles squamous cell carcinoma but not of the type that we're used to, that is with typical keratinization, keratin formation, invasiveness, and so forth. And I'll show you them in a minute. Liver lesions included hepato and cholangiocellular carcinomas, also foci of cell alteration, once again suggesting this preneoplastic effect in induction. Typical skin lesion that one can see here with the proliferation of neoplastic cells down into dermal connective tissue. And again, if you almost blink and close your eyes, I, I start to try and imagine the formation of uh, keratin precursors and the little whirling and formation of pearls, but I don't see it. All right, once again, a resemblance to squamous cell carcinoma in the skin of these brown bullheads, but not an ac exactly analogous to that which we see in keratinized mammalian skin. This is a, hepat a hepatocellular carcinoma, normal liver here, proliferating tissue here, once again, moderately well differentiated, but lacking cord structure. Increased the amount of basophilian cell cytoplasm. There is a lack of mitotic activity here. I'm relatively unimpressed by this. And again, the formation of some of these nodules present in the liver with cystic spaces that are compressing normal tissue. And cholangiocellular carcinoma in brown bullheads. Once again, more primitive type of cholangial formation, uh, higher degree of cell pleomorphism, increased amount of connective tissue present in the liver. And you can see these things being quite invasive and in some cases having necrotic centers. Portions of the Great Lakes are, of course, contaminated with polychlorinated biphenyls as well as other compounds. Once again, we find that these are ubiquitous pollutants in the environment. We know that they're carcinogens in mammals. There's been a great degree of, uh, a great amount of manufacture and their use that's contaminated the water supply of the Great Lakes. Leatherland and Sonstegard reported in 1978 epizootics of testicular tumors, particularly Sertoli cell tumors in cyprinids, goldfish, carp, and hybrid crosses in Lake Ontario. The incidence of tumors approached 100% in those hybrid animals, suggesting their ability to both metabolize compounds present in their polluted environment and other unspecified increased genetic susceptibilities. 
The incidence of these testicular tumors increased dramatically after 1952. It was during that period of time that there was a relatively heavy increase in industrialization in the area and contamination of the environment with PCBs and chlorinated pesticides like DDT. And they found by looking at these fish and looking at them, which were a commercial fish before this period of time, that the incidence was low. So again, there was this sort of lengthy period of time in which one could see an abrupt change in the incidence, which was important. They described two types of Sertoli cell tumors. One primarily composed of Sertoli cells with very little lipid and few germinal cells. The other type containing large numbers of spermatogonia, Sertoli cells with lipid, and an abundance of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Of interest is the fact that ovarian neoplasms, another germ cell tumor, have been found in ornamental hybrid carp in contaminated environments in ponds in Japan. Most are moderately well differentiated granulosa and fecal cell tumors. There have been at least a half a dozen other well documented studies in the field of feral fish that have developed an increased incidence of neoplasia. I'd like to close by doing two things. One is talking about what do these studies tell us. First, we know that a variety of fish in polluted environments can develop neoplasms. Skin and liver neoplasms are the most common. Fish live in water. They breathe water. They eat things that are contained in water. They're constantly immersed in the material. The level of exposure of fish in comparison to mammals is quite high because of their, in, in their immersion in polluted material. Those parts of the body that are the most they come in contact with it the most, the skin and the liver, the primary site of metabolism in species, are the most likely to be affected. We've already discussed this age-related increase. There's a very rough relationship with known carcinogens like chlorinated pesticides and PCBs and the incidence of neoplasms in some species of fish in some polluted environments. We know that bottom-dwelling and bottom-feeding fish are more likely to develop neoplasms. Not all species have comparable susceptibility. And this is something that I think we have to pay attention to that may be very important, is to identify both sensitive and insensitive species when we're considering environmental monitoring and using these species. In most cases, correlative lab studies have not been done. It's been our intent here at Virginia Tech for a number of years to systematically study PCBs. We determined the first thing that we have to do is understand the development of the immune system since we think that's a primary factor. And once we can determine how PCBs suppress or alter immune function, we think we'll have some idea of how PCBs may be carcinogens in fish. I leave you with a few slides that should provoke some thought. Channel catfish, Ictolurus punctatus, dermal melanoma. Again, an aggregation of neoplastic transformed and somewhat invasive melanocytes. Papillomas on fish. We know that many of them may be viral, related to contact. They're infectious. They spread in hatcheries. They spread in fish that have high contact. What's happening if pollution is suppressing the immune system? And so these animals are not able to resist the effects of this virus, which causes this proliferation. More papillomas. Cauliflower disease, perhaps. Dermal papillomas in fingerling salmon. Goiter or thyroid adenomas. Lipomas and myxomas in angelfish. All of these things may be something that may be important to us as veterinary pathologists, as environmentalists, and in the larger society. We have to understand how a polluted environment can increase our risk of developing, developing a neoplasm and take heed of these examples to determine what we're going to do to prevent them and to study them. I'm sure that there are a number of people in the next few days that are going to present papers which describe more examples of contamination and potential effects of infectious processes. And for me, this is an important issue which needs further study. I uh, thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to try and answer them.